Smallpox, Part 2. In general populations, who historically come from families who have experienced smallpox for centuries before, the average mortality rate is about 30%. Now, today, when we hear a percentage of 30%, we often don't think of that as being too dramatically high. But if you think of 100 people infected with smallpox, and out of that 100, 30 will die, it really is a significant high mortality rate. In fact, even today, when mortality rates reach 10 to 20%, our public health authorities start to take notice and investigate the cause of a mortality rate of anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, or of course even more. So 30 percent really is significant, and again, it's going to depend upon if your ancestors have ever encountered the same disease before. We're going to find that for populations who had never been exposed to smallpox before in their history, have a much, much higher mortality rate than even 30%. Those high numbers, 80, 90, almost 100% mortality, those do catch our attention. Even patients who survived the toxemia of or viremia, the virus being present in their bloodstream and causing havoc, sometimes died of secondary complications. And of course, those are the poor, sad individuals who we still have images of in our collective minds of why we need to worry about smallpox. those folks who survive and recover, how do we get well if we have smallpox? The kind of immunity that develops when we get sick is called active natural immunity. Active because our own immune systems create the immune components. Natural because it's part of everyday living. So if you accidentally get sick with a microorganism, and have an infectious disease like smallpox, your body will try to combat or fight off that infection with active natural immunity. Now for most patients who contract smallpox historically, it might take anywhere from three to four weeks to go through all of the phases and begin to enter into the convalescent phase. So for anywhere from 21 to 30 days, patients are essentially incapacitated and unable to work or, of course, come in contact with anyone else because smallpox is highly contagious, easily transferred from person to person, or as we've noticed, by droplet through air or even on fomites like bedding, handkerchiefs, clothing. And as such, because it is highly contagious, we have to be well aware of the immune factors that are constantly fighting or trying to reverse those effects of that disease. Historically, it's often been observed that once someone had survived a case of smallpox, they never contracted the disease again, and in fact, could serve as nurse or healthcare provider to new patients who did contract the disease. So for many folks, one exposure often did lead to lifelong immunity. But this isn't true of every case. And in fact, we'll find historically, for some individuals, a booster shot was necessary to confer consistent and persistent immunity. One of the sources of immunity when we have a, an active natural case of disease, would be antibody-mediated immunity. Antibodies are serum proteins that can clearly recognize and attack unwanted infectious agents like smallpox virus. One of the unique characteristics 
characteristics of antibodies are the antigen binding sites. Antigens are referring to anything that could be considered perhaps foreign or non-self. And of course, surface structures on viruses make ideal antigens. Antibodies are the serum proteins our bodies make to essentially grab onto and try to eliminate antigen or infectious microorganisms. Notice in the illustration, the antigen binding structures or the little tip ends of the little arm like wing shaped structures on the antibody can easily grab onto pieces of antigenic material. This would also include, again, structures sticking out of the surface of viruses. This allows antibodies to be very effective immune factors that will try to attack and eliminate the viruses. You may recall from previous discussions that antibodies are produced by both B lymphocytes and plasma cells, also called plasmacytes. Both B lymphocytes and plasmacytes can produce antibodies in various quantities. B lymphocytes are our first line defenders that encounter antigen and produce antibodies to eliminate those antigens. Once activated, some of the B lymphocytes transform into plasma cells or plasmacytes and produce even more or higher concentrations of those specific antibodies that can attack the specific antigenic targets. For the production of antibodies, B cells will need the assistance of T cells. Most antigens or most infectious agents are going to be what we call T cell dependent. In other words, T and B cells both have to work together in order to destroy whatever the infectious agent or microorganism is. For viruses, since viruses have to be inside of cells to cause infection, more times than not, we're going to need both CD4 and CD8 positive T lymphocytes to assist B cells in both the production of antibodies as well as the production of CD8 positive lymphocytes that will kill the virally infected cells directly. So in order for us to develop immunity to smallpox, we need both B lymphocytes functioning and producing antibodies with the assistance of CD4 positive T lymphocytes and we will need the killing power of the CD8 positive T lymphocytes that will target the virally infected cells directly and destroy them. Some of the symptoms that we observe in cases like smallpox are due to the immunologic battle that occurs inside the body and inside of our cells and tissues as our immune system tries to destroy and eliminate the smallpox virus. It's a fierce battle, and hopefully we win. <laughs>